Welcome back for our fourth and for now final module on Financial Toolkit for Lawyers. In this module, we're going to discuss financial statement analysis. In previous modules, we discussed how financial statements are made. And in creating financial statements, we learned what goes into them. Now, to really fulfill our potential for becoming excellent consumers of financial information, we're going to discuss what we can get out of financial statements. They can tell a lot about the health of a company, its prospects for the future, and whether investors or management should change their behavior based on performance. Financial statement analysis is a quantitative process where we use data and numbers that we will then analyze to get information about how companies are performing. This is the fourth in my series of Financial Toolkit for Lawyers, although it is Chapter 12 in Introduction to Financial Accounting uh, by Lyrics. The other chapters in between are less relevant for lawyers, and again, I'm really focusing this lecture on helping lawyers become excellent consumers of financial information. For those that are looking to become producers of financial information, i.e. accountants, I would recommend taking a more fulsome course. But for those of you that are looking to get up to speed in how to use financial accounting as a lawyer, you're in the right place. So let's get started. We only have two major learning objectives for this lesson, but there's a lot packed into these learning objectives. So it is a lot of content, but we're going to get through it together and you're going to come away knowing a lot more than you did at the beginning about how to understand the financial health and well-being of a company. We're going to begin by talking about the four major types of financial ratios. Liquidity ratios, which measure the ability to pay debt. Profitability ratios, which measure the ability to generate return on investment. Leverage ratios, which measure the business's relative debt. And market ratios, which measure financial returns to shareholders and market perceptions of value. We're then going to talk about these ratio analyses in two different contexts. One is a horizontal trend analysis, which means the change in a company's performance over a period of time. You can think of the time horizon to remember horizontal analysis. Vertical trend analysis is going to take a deeper dive into a company's performance in a given period. It's like a snapshot. And by Using both horizontal and vertical trend analysis of the ratios we're going to learn in this module, you will better understand how to analyze financial statements. We are going to cover a lot of ground today, so let me tell you what we have in store. We're first going to talk about liquidity ratios. Liquidity ratios analyze the company's ability to pay for its short-term obligations. In other words, does it have enough cash to pay for its ongoing business needs? First, we look at the current ratio, which is the current assets divided by current liabilities. And that tells us something about the ability of the company to use its assets to pay its liabilities. But not all of current assets are easy to access. And so the quick ratio or acid test will exclude current assets that cannot be converted into cash quickly. The accounts receivable collection period measures how quickly the company collects money owed to it. And the days of sale in inventory measures how quickly the company sells its inventory. Combining these two tells us how long it takes the company to complete what's called the revenue operating cycle. And that informs how able the company is to pay its suppliers. Profitability ratios deal with how much the company is earning based on the assets that it is employing. The gross profit ratio is the percent of revenue left after cost of goods is deducted it's a very top-line number because cost of goods is not the only cost that can reduce how much cash a company actually ends up with after selling products. The operating profit ratio takes a bit of a deeper slice 
and includes not only cost of goods sold, but other operating revenues, such as marketing, etc., which would then be deducted, and therefore it will be a smaller percentage than gross profit. Net profit ratio is smaller still. It calculates the percent of revenue left after all costs, including taxes and financing costs, are deducted. The sales to total asset ratio equals top line sales divided by assets, and it shows how efficient the company is with its use of assets. The return on equity ratio likewise shows how efficient the company is with its use of equity. It is calculated by bottom line net income divided by equity, and it shows how efficiently equity is put to use to generate profits. Leverage ratios deal with the structure, the financial structure of the corporation and the relationship between the corporation stockholders and creditors. The debt ratio simply divides total assets by total liabilities. This shows what percent of the company is owed to creditors. And it varies inversely with the equity ratio, which simply divides total equity by total assets. Since assets always equals liabilities plus equity, these ratios vary inversely to each other. The times interest earned ratio indicates a company's ability to pay interest to long-term creditors by dividing income from operations by interest expense. Market ratios can be used to compare corporations to each other or to industry benchmarks. They can be used to help investors decide whether to invest or divest investments in a corporation. Earnings per share measures stockholders' returns on a per share basis. And the price to earnings ratio calculates the market price divided by earnings per share. It's thought to show the market's expectations of a corporation's future profitability. And the dividend yield is calculated by dividing the dividend per share by the market price per share. This metric is useful for investors who are looking to maximize steady cash income from dividends. There are other financial ratios, and we could go on and on, but let's start with these, and I think it will give you a good sense of how financial analysis works in general. Who uses financial statement analysis? Various people do. Various stakeholders, such as stockholders, creditors, potential investors, and others will analyze a company's liquidity, profitability, and financial structure over a period of time and compare the results to industry benchmarks to see if the company is better or worse than its competitors across those metrics. Ratios are common metrics that are used to evaluate the financial health and well-being of companies in an industry. A ratio is a stated relationship between two numbers of the same kind. A financial ratio is a measure of the magnitude between two selected numbers taken from a financial statement. You probably also learned in third grade that ratios are fractions. So as you'll see, we're going to do a lot of dividing one thing by another. By doing this division in the same way for different companies within an industry, we can compare them using common metrics. Our first set of financial ratios deal with profits. Profits are the difference between how much revenue a company took in and how much expenses it took out. A simpler example is for a company that sells goods. Not all companies sell goods. Lawyers like us, we offer services. But let's start with the simpler example of a company that sells goods. We can determine the gross profit by taking the net sales, that's the revenue from the sales, minus the cost of the goods sold, which is the expenses we incurred in selling those goods. The revenues, the sales, minus the expenses, the cost of goods sold, equals the gross profit. 
So far, so good. It's just simple arithmetic at this point. The gross profit ratio is defined as the gross profit divided by net sales. Or you could think of it as profits divided by revenues. In this case, the gross profit, which is the amount that the company made after accounting for the cost of goods sold, was $700. And the amount of revenue generated, the amount of sales taken in, was $3,200. 700 divided by 3,200 equals 22%. And by the way, profit ratios are often expressed in a percentage. Again, you divide the gross profit by the net sales to arrive at the gross profit ratio of 22%. Another way to state the ratio is 22 to 1. That means for every $1 in sales, the company earns, on average, $0.022 after cost of goods sold, covering expenses. Let's see how we can use this ratio of the profit ratio to compare several firms. As I mentioned at the outset, the advantage of having a standard metric is that by using the same metric, we can compare apples to apples and decide which firm is a better investment, for example. In this case, company A, B, and C all have different gross profit and sales amounts, but the gross profit ratio allows for an evaluation of all three because it shares the same context. The gross profit ratio for each of these companies is found, as always, by dividing the gross profit by the net sales. So in the case of company A, it's 700 over 3,200. Company B, you divide 650 over 2,800. And company C, you would divide 540 over 2,340. Although those numbers are quite different, we find at the end of the day that the gross profit ratios are more similar than you might have guessed. And moreover, two of these companies have the same gross profit ratio. Even though one of them made significantly more sales, they made the same gross profit ratio. All else being equal, a higher gross profit ratio is better because it means you're getting a higher return for each of the sales you make. So, so far, companies B and C are slightly beating out company A in terms of our analysis. But one would not expect the gross profit ratio to be comparable when companies produced very different things. The gross profit ratio on, for example, bananas could be really different than the industry standard gross profit ratio for microchips, for example. The gross profit ratio analysis alone is not a definitive tool. In fact, none of these ratios alone by itself tells you all that much. Rather, combined with professional judgment, we can apply these analysis selectively to businesses that have similar industries and similar product mixes to determine which of them is the stronger investment. As we go through these, remember that ratio analysis only looks at quantitative factors. It looks at numbers and data. But qualitative factors, such as possessing adequate capacity, or having good management, or having the necessary equipment for potential changes in production, also provide valuable insights. You can't put Elon Musk into a data table, but he certainly has an effect on his company. The Musk effect, one might say, is a qualitative factor, and it may mean that an investment in Tesla cannot be totally understood by, for example, comparing its gross profit ratio to that of Ford, because there are qualitative factors that are also important. Remember, the main purpose of this ratio analysis is to get a quantitative idea of how these companies probably compare, and then we will resolve to do further analysis and investigation. There are four major types of financial ratios. 
The liquidity ratio measures the ability to pay current liabilities as they come due. The profitability ratio measures the ability to generate an adequate return on assets employed and on shareholder investment, also known as return on investment. Leverage ratios measure the business's relative debt, and that helps us understand its long-term financial viability. If a company cannot pay its debts, it may go into bankruptcy and may be unable to continue operating. And fourth are market ratios, which measure financial returns to shareholders and market perception of its value. Have you ever had the experience of not having cash when you needed it? Maybe you missed a rent payment, or you weren't able to pay your credit card down and got hit with interest or penalties. See, having profits is not the same as having cash, and it's important to be able to meet short-term cash needs if a business is going to continue as a going concern. Liquidity ratios help us understand whether a company is in a good position to meet its ongoing short-term cash needs. Net profit does not mean cash in the bank. Profitable companies without sufficient cash reserves are at risk of not meeting their short-term obligations. So let's look at working capital and we'll use the working capital ratio to understand whether a company is likely able to meet its short-term cash needs. Working capital is the dollar value difference between a company's current assets and current liabilities at a point in time. Let's briefly review what are current assets and current liabilities. Current assets are typically defined as the assets of a company that are expected to be used or consumed through standard business operations within one year. And assets are resources with economic value that will provide a future benefit. So current assets are resources with economic value that are expected to provide a future benefit within this accounting period or year. The most common of these current assets is cash. Cash is liquid, it can be freely used, and it often is what is used to pay current liabilities. Let's talk about current liabilities for a moment. Current liabilities are a company's obligations that are due within a year or a normal operating cycle. The most common current liability is accounts payable. Accounts payable are amounts due to vendors or suppliers for goods or services received that have not been paid for yet. Therefore, the operating cycle is the process by which current assets are used to satisfy current liabilities. Now, does that help you see why comparing current assets and current liabilities helps us understand if a company is likely to meet its short-term obligations? Let's compare one company and see if it's become more or less able to meet its ongoing obligations as time goes on. Let's look at its ratios at different points in time, namely 2019, 2020, and 2021. Over the course of this period, from 2019 to 2021, working capital decreased by $158 from the previous year. Working capital is the difference between current assets and current liabilities. So a decrease in working capital by itself does show that the company has somewhat less ability to meet its ongoing obligations. Moreover, the fact that working capital is decreasing means the company might be getting itself closer to a position where its current liabilities exceed its current assets. And that's like not being able to pay your rent when rent is due. That's a problem. But we can do more than simply look at the difference between current assets and current liabilities. Let's define this as a ratio because a percentage is easier to compare as the numbers scale. Again, current assets are resources that a company can use in the current operating cycle. 
The biggest one is usually cash, but some businesses also have a lot of accounts receivable, which is money that is owed to them for services rendered or goods delivered that hasn't been paid to the company yet. In addition, the company may have some short-term investments or inventories that could be liquidated and turned into cash. The total of these is the total current assets. And current liabilities is often primarily accounts payable, which are monies owed to vendors and suppliers that have provided goods and services to the company for which the company has not paid yet. Kind of like what you owe on your credit card. And in fact, borrowing money and racking up debt also results in current liabilities as that debt needs to be paid on an ongoing basis. So current liabilities in this company are comprised of borrowings, accounts payable, and income taxes payable, which results in total current liabilities. The current ratio is going to express working capital as a fraction or as a ratio. And it's decided by current assets divided by current liabilities. It's calculated by current assets divided by current liabilities. For this company, we can also see that the current ratio is decreasing over time, although it's not as bad a picture as it looked when we first analyzed the working capital alone. In 2019, the current ratio which is calculated by current assets divided by current liabilities was 1.91 to 1. In 2020, that number shrunk to a current ratio of 1.07 to 1. Remember that if that current ratio goes below 1, that means that liabilities exceed assets. And when liabilities exceed assets, we may have problems paying those liabilities with our assets. So we got pretty close to the line in 2020 and then had a bit of a recovery in 2021, calculating the current ratio as current assets, 1433, divided by current liabilities, 1255, resulting in a current ratio of 1.14 to 1. Usually, the higher the ratio, the better, because it shows the company has more cash on hand to pay its ongoing liabilities. Of course, that's only true to a point. Maybe the company is not doing smart things with its cash, like reinvesting them. In any event, it is usually better to have a higher current ratio. And so the decline in current ratio over time may be a cause for concern, although at least we can see some evidence that that trend is not totally downward. Maybe there's a correction. There's reason to dig in and learn more here. The current ratio alone tells us a lot, but once again, we want to look at all of these quantitative analytical numbers in context and along with other numbers. So let's compare the current ratio of two different companies who have the same current ratio of two to one, but notably are going to be able to pay liabilities using very different assets. Company B has a lot of cash. The advantage to having a lot of cash is you don't need to do anything to liquidate it. It's cash on hand that can be used immediately to pay debts, which puts Corporation B in a strong position. Now, Corporation A has the same current ratio. Trust me, or do the math yourself. But how is that achieved? It's achieved by having a great deal of inventory. Well, there's a lot of cause for concern here. For one thing, inventory can't be liquidated as quickly as cash. And maybe there's a reason for all this stockpile of inventory. Maybe nobody wants this company's stuff. So once again, you can't just compare current ratios between two companies and say that they're the same if the current ratio is the same. Rather, it's just one qualitative snapshot that gives you some insight into the health of these companies. The acid test is designed to address weaknesses found in the current ratio. We calculate the acid test ratio as follows. It's a little more complex of an equation. The acid test ratio is calculated by, in the numerator, 
adding cash and short-term investments and accounts receivable, and dividing that by current liabilities. Note that inventories is not included in the acid test ratio. For the reasons that we just discussed, cash is king. It can be used immediately to pay any ongoing obligation. Short-term investments are also generally liquid and will turn into cash in a short time. Accounts receivable are theoretically liquid. There's also a industry called factoring, and there are businesses out there that will give you cash now in exchange for your accounts receivable. So accounts receivable are pretty liquid. Inventories are truly less liquid than the other current assets, and so they are excluded from the acid test ratio. This will give us a different picture of the company's health that we just reviewed. The acid test ratio, also called the quick ratio, excludes accounts that cannot be converted into cash quickly. Hence the term quick ratio, it consists of assets that can be turned into cash quickly, which are cash, short-term investments, and accounts receivable. All of those together would then be divided by current liabilities to arrive at the quick ratio. An alternative approach to quick ratio is instead of adding up all of the current assets that can be converted into cash, we can look at all of our current assets and subtract the ones that are not easily converted into cash. So, although inventory is technically a current asset, it doesn't necessarily convert into cash quickly and easily. Likewise, prepaid expenses, the money that the company is owed, or the services the company is owed, I should say, the company, when prepaid expenses are when the company has, well, prepaid for goods or services in the future. It may or may not be able to get cash back for those. So, two different approaches to the acid test ratio or quick ratio either add up all the truly accessible short term assets, namely cash, short term investments, and accounts receivable, or take the entire current assets and subtract the ones that are not truly accessible, namely inventory and prepaid expenses, that's the numerator, and then divide it by the current liabilities. Whichever test you use, make sure you use it consistently so that every company that you are studying gets the same mathematical test. What is a good acid test ratio? Different benchmarks are provided for different industries, but I guess if you had to put a number to it in general, one-to-one -one is usually considered reasonable. One-to-one -one means the company literally has enough short-term cash and cash-like assets on hand to meet all of its obligations, although not much more. And of course, it has the ability in many cases to obtain additional assets and resources that can be converted into cash. So one-to-one -one is considered a reasonable benchmark. When we take a horizontal or time horizon, uh, time uh, a series analysis of a company, what we want to look at is how is the company faring over time? We want to see the acid test ratio increase or at least hold steady. What we see in this corporation is not only did the acid test ratio start at less than one to one, it continued to decline over the next two year period. That's concerning. We generally count accounts receivable in the quick ratio because accounts receivable usually can be turned into cash pretty quickly. However, that's not always the case. So we might measure the liquidity ratio based on accounts receivable and how long it takes to get paid for them. In other words, about how long does it take for the company to collect on amounts due? The way you calculate this is average accounts receivable divided by net credit sales times 365, as in 365 days. 
This should give us an indication, at least within one company, as to whether it's getting better or worse at turning its accounts receivable into cash. We can look at the change in average receivable collection period to see if a company's health is getting better or worse. And we do this by averaging its accounts receivable over a period and comparing that to a different period. Let me give you an example. The average accounts receivable in 2020 and 2021 would be found by adding the accounts receivable in 2020 plus the accounts receivable in 2021 divided by two, which would equal an average accounts receivable of $482 over the period 2020 to 2021. In 2019, we had a accounts receivable of 257. In 2020, that went to 240, 420, excuse me. And the average of those two numbers combined is 338.5. Next, we're going to divide that by the net sales in the latter portion of the two-year period. So we divide on the one hand for 2020 to 2021, we divide 482 by 3200, multiply that by 365 days because these are accounts receivable over a year period. We want to understand how this is impacting days to obtain payment and that results in 55 days for the 2020 to 2021 period. In 2019 to 2020, however, we would divide 338.5, which was the average of the accounts receivable in those two years, divided by the net sales in the latter period, multiply that by the number of days in a year, 365, and we get 44 days. The company's collection period is increasing and it exceeds the net 30-day credit period that we would like to see. Once again, there is evidence that this company's financial health is getting worse. Getting paid on stuff you sold is great, but companies also have to make stuff to sell in the first place. And it costs money to keep those things on hand in an inventory. So we would want to look at the number of days our stuff is sitting in an inventory because hopefully that number is getting shorter, showing a high demand for our goods and a reduction in our inventory. We don't want stuff gathering dust in a warehouse somewhere. We want to exchange our inventory for cash as quickly as possible. We can do that with another liquidity ratio, the number of days in sales and inventory, which measures the number of days that can be serviced by existing inventory levels. It measures the average number of days needed to collect an amount due compared with the collection period. Let's take a look at an example, and I think it will make more sense. Let's see how this plays out for the company we've been analyzing. In 2019, they had $361 worth of inventories. It rose to $503 of inventories in 2020 and up to $833 in 2021. But we need a ratio to be able to compare these numbers more effectively. Here's how we calculate it. We're first going to calculate the average inventory over a period of two years. In this case, 2020 to 2021 has an average inventory calculated simply by adding the two numbers together and dividing by two, which results in 668. And in 2019 to 2020, that average was $432. Now we're not done yet, that's still an absolute number, we want to create that as a ratio. So we're going to divide the average inventory by the cost of goods sold. And in the case of 2020 to 2021, that's going to, we then multiply by 365 days to get a number of days that it takes us to clear the inventory. And we see that the company is investing more in its inventory than it previously had been. Why are inventories growing? We're starting to paint a rather troubling financial picture. The increase is significant as well. We have gone from 73 days to 98 days. Another metric is to analyze how many days it, to it takes to complete what's called the revenue operating cycle. An operating cycle begins when inventory is purchased and that results in a liability for the cost of the inventory. That liability is resolved when cash payment to the supplier of the inventory is made, 
the inventory is then sold to a consumer, which results in an asset called accounts receivable. And then that accounts receivable asset is resolved when the cash is collected from the consumer. Therefore, one operating cycle begins when inventory is purchased and ends when cash for it is actually collected. We can find this number by adding the information that we calculated from the previous two analyses. We just calculated the average number of days sales and in inventory and saw that increase from 73 to 98. In addition, we calculated how long it took us to collect on our accounts receivable. That increased from 44 days to 55 days, which means that the entire cycle stretched from 117 days from purchasing the inventory to getting paid for the resale of it to 153 days. Now the picture is looking even worse than it did before. We want that operating cycle as quick as possible so we can turn over more goods and won't get stuck with a ton of inventory or accounts receivable that we have to write off because they never get paid. The number of days to complete the revenue operating cycle has significantly increased from 117 days to 153 days, a 30% increase. If our accounts payable are net 60 days, meaning we have to pay our accounts within 60 days, then our company will not be able to pay its suppliers because the number of days in the cycle exceeds the 60 day terms. In other words, we don't have enough liquidity to continue purchasing inventory. And we can't do business as a reseller of goods if we can't afford to purchase inventory. This is showing a significant problem with the financial health of this company. It appears that Big Dog Car Works Corporation is growing less liquid. Current assets, especially quick assets, are declining relative to current liabilities, and the revenue operating cycle is increasing. Now that we've cleared up some liquidity ratios, which related to how able the company was to meet its ongoing obligations, let's talk about its profitability. The simplest profitability ratio is called gross profit ratio. It's the percentage of sales revenue left after cost of goods sold. It's found by dividing gross profits by net sales. Let's take a look at how that breaks down in our company's example. Remember that gross profits is simply net sales minus cost of goods sold, how much we made after we received revenue and accounted for our expenses in generating that revenue. And then we divide that back by the one of the numbers that it came from, the net sales. A fairly simple analysis. So how does that break down for this company over time? In 2019, it was 23.08%. It bumped up slightly to 23.21% in 2020 and then declined a fair bit more to 21.88% in 2021. All else being equal, you'd rather have a company be more profitable and have a higher profit ratio. How can we understand these numbers? This ratio has not changed significantly over three years, but a small, decline, a small decline as a percentage can affect net income because gross profit is a large component of the income statement. You can see here that we did decline what seems to be a nominally minuscule amount of change between 2019 and 2020, but Again, that amount is very impactful because gross profit is such a big factor in determining our income. Gross profit is not the most refined number, but it gives us a starting point. Let's talk about some more specialized ratios that tell us about profitability. Operating profit ratio is the percentage of sales revenue left after cost of goods sold and operating expenses have been taken out. It's found by income from operations divided by net sales. 
Income from operations is going to be a little bit further down the chart. It should be a line item at the arrow. And once again, we divide that by net sales. Resulting in the following numbers. Despite both increasing sales and income from operations, the operating profit ratios are relatively flat. We're doing more work, but we're not getting much more out of it. The percentage went from 8.72 in 2019 to 9.75 in 2020 to 9.38 in 2021. Was this good or bad? Once again, let's perform a horizontal analysis to see how this change in time for one company shows the health of that company. Well, from 2019 to 2020, that number went up by 34% in terms of income. And in 2020 to 2021, income went up only 9%. We can see from this that sales is not rising nearly as fast as increases of goods sold or operating expenses, resulting in a significant deceleration, a smaller increase in income from 34% to 9%. And it's even possible that income could go down in 2022, given this trend line. That's cause for concern. We need to have incomes continuing to increase. Otherwise, what is the point of having more sales if we're actually creating less and less income and making less and less profit on those greater sales? This is a concept called diminishing economies of scale, and it shows that there may be some inefficiency in the business. Next, let's look at another profitability ratio, net profit ratio. That's the percentage of sales revenue retained after all of our expenses. It's found by dividing net income by net sales. In other words, how much of what we're selling is resulting in income after the costs of all that are said and done. So we look to the bottom to find the net income after we have paid taxes, et cetera, et cetera, and, and spent all of our costs. We divide that by the top line number, just the total revenue from sales, and that results in net income. Here's how net profit is calculated for our company. In 2019, it was 4.79. In 2020, it was 4.18. And in 2021, it was 3.63. This you might consider to be relatively flat, although it is decreasing. Meaning, over time, our sales are resulting in less profits per sale. What's going on with that? It's probably due to some type of increase in expenses. And we can look back on the chart previously and see that one of the significant increases is how much we're paying for financing. Our interest cost has gone up dramatically, and that has eaten away at our profits. Financing costs are a cost and as a result, they hit our net income. This company has been increasing every year dramatically the amount of financing interest that it's paying, resulting in a steady decline to profits because that money, instead of going to profits, is going to pay to whomever we owe this financing debt. The next way we'll analyze profitability is comparing sales to total assets ratio, which is sales earned relative to assets invested. In other words, how many sales are we getting for the amount that we've put into the company? Once again, let's take a look at the numbers. Again, we go to net sales, which is going to be a key metric for understanding our sales. And here we divide it by our assets. How much are we making with our assets? Are our assets productive or unproductive? And how is that changing over time? We're once again going to average this over periods, and we can do that math, which has been done for you on the screen. But let's get to the numbers. The key thing is that both sales and average total assets have increased which sounds like it's a good thing. We have more assets and we're making more sales. 
but sales has weakened relative to the amount of assets invested each year. In other words, although we have more sales and more assets, we're getting less value out of each additional asset. Again, this is called declining returns to scale or diseconomies of scale, and that shows there's some type of inefficiency at this point in our process. Assets are not producing revenues as effectively as in the past. We need to understand why. It would be useful to know what the industry looks like for this particular company. And does it track? There are some industries which can grow or need to grow exceedingly large and will continue becoming more profitable as they get bigger. There are other industries where there are natural limits to the size that they can reach while being profitable. It seems that our company is facing a serious challenge here because the sales to assets to total assets ratio is decreasing significantly year over year. Again, this means that we are getting less value out of all those assets we're investing. And by the way, if you're an investor, would you choose to put your money in a company like that, knowing that each additional dollar is less productive than the previous one? No. This is a big concern for investors as well, which could hurt our ability to generate new capital in the future. Next, let's discuss another profitability ratio, the return on total assets ratio. That's the efficiency of assets used to produce income from operations. It's found by dividing income from operations on average total assets. Once again, let's take a look at our numbers. We can find easily income from operations, we divide that by total assets, and we're going to average the total assets over a two-year period. We average the assets over a two-year period, and that work has been done for you in the chart shown here, and what do we find? Both income from operations and average total assets have increased, but income from operations weakened relative to the amount of assets invested each year, going along with our picture that we're getting less value for our assets. This means that assets are not being used as efficiently as in the past. We're not generating the same amount of returns for our, from our assets. Are they aging? Are we inefficient? Is there mismanagement? Have we grown too large? More useful information about the company's plans and projections would be useful to understand why we have gone from 15.53% return on total assets to 13.05%. Again, a troubling downturn. The next profitability ratio we should look at is the return on equity ratio, which measures the return to stockholders in the form of net income earned for the owners. It's calculated by dividing net income over average equity. Average equity is the equity over a two-year period, in this case 2019 to 2020 versus 2020 to 2021. We can do that by adding the two and dividing by two. And equity is both the amount paid for the common stock and retained earnings. So we divide net income by the average of equity over that two year period, as shown on the next slide. This slide shows the return on equity ratios that are calculated by averaging the equity over a two year period and then dividing it by the net income for the latter period. In this case, net income has weakened relative to the amount of equity invested by stockholders over a two-year period. In other words, the company is making less money per shareholder dollar invested. Shareholders are likely to be unhappy with this. However, it would be good to know what are the industry averages. If the industry's average was 5%, these ratios would still be quite positive. They might have been unusually high at one point and now are just high. On the other hand, if industry averages are 10% and we are at 956 and slipping, that's a real concern because shareholders are unlikely to stay with the company. Instead, they'll pull out their money and put their money somewhere where there's better earnings for the dollars they invest. Leverage ratios talk about the relationship between creditors who have given loans to the company, and stockholders who have purchased investments in the company. Both stockholders and creditors have claims to portions of the company's assets. 
Remember that assets equals liabilities plus equity. Liabilities represents money owed to creditors. Equity represents money owed to shareholders. We also know that sums to the total assets of the company, as shown in this example. The accounting equation thus expresses a relationship between assets owned by an entity and the claims against those assets. On the left, assets means how much value the company itself has. In the middle, liabilities is how much of that value is owed to creditors. And on the right, how much of that value is owed to stockholders. Together, creditor and stockholder capital form the financial structure of the corporation. And the leverage ratios thus tell us something about this corporation's particular financial structure. The first leverage ratio is the debt ratio. It measures the proportion of assets financed by debt. It's calculated by total liabilities divided by total assets. And we can see that over time, we simply divide the total liabilities, which are the sum of all the liabilities in a given year, by the total assets in that given year. And that will resolve in the debt ratio. The debt ratio can be expressed as a percentage or as a ratio. And this shows what percentage of the company is owed to debt holders. We can see that that number has gone up from 26.01% to 43.42% to 50.48%. It's concerning when the debt ratio becomes high because if a company does not pay its debt holders, they can bring that, that company to bankruptcy. And a company in bankruptcy may have to sell off its assets at a low price, greatly hurting any value left over for shareholders as the debt holders try to collect on the liabilities owed to them. Let's take a look at this company's debt ratios over time. In 2019, it was 26.01. In 2020, it was 43.42. And in 2021, it rose to 50.48. In other words, in 2019, the company's assets were financed only 26% by debt, and the remainder, since assets equals liabilities plus equity, was for equity holders. In other words, 74% of the assets were financed by equity. As that debt number climbed to 50% or so, that necessarily means that the equity percentage must decrease, decline, and that's exactly what we see when we calculate the equity ratio, which is a function of the debt ratio. The equity ratio can also be calculated directly. The equity ratio is found by dividing the total equity over total assets. For example, in 2019, if there was $1,048 in equity and $1,417 in assets, we would arrive at a ratio of 73.96% and so on. And it's going to follow in exact opposite order. It's going to inversely co-vary with the debt ratio. Generally, it's considered unfavorable for equity ratio to be decreasing because that means the debt ratio is increasing. They are opposite and equal to each other because of the fundamental equation. The greater the debt financing, the greater the risk, because principal and interest payments are part of the debt financing, and they must be paid. And again, we see that over time, the equity ratio is going down as the debt ratio is going up, showing, yet again, a problem lurking in this company's financial statements. The next leverage ratio is the debt to equity ratio, which measures the proportion of creditors to shareholders' claims. It's calculated by dividing total liabilities over equity. Let's take a look at how that breaks down in our company. Total liabilities are found as a line item on the balance sheet, as are total equity. And we simply divide one by the other to get the debt to equity ratio. 
What do we think of these numbers? Well, the debt to equity ratio is going up and in fact begins at 0.35 and ends up in excess of one, meaning that there is more debt than equity that this company is beholden to at the end of this period. Here's a company where the debt to equity ratio is increasing from 0.35 to 1 all the way to 1.02 to 1. This means that in 2019, there was 35 cents of debt liability for each dollar of equity. In 2021, there's now a dollar two cents of liability for each dollar of equity. Not only is this trend showing a dramatic increase in debt versus equity, but we now have more debt than equity, which is cause for great concern. Going from 0.35 to 1 in 2019, up to 0.77 to 1 in 2020, all the way to 1.02 to 1. Debt isn't all bad. There's a lot of cases that debt is useful. The pros include... Management's reliance on creditor financing can be a good thing because issuing more shares to investors weakens the percentage of ownership and control of existing shareholders. The shareholders may want to retain their voting rights and not give it up in order to get more capital. And the existing stockholders may see creditor financing as a good decision if the company can earn more with borrowed funds than the interest paid on the debt. In other words, if the amount generated from each dollar of debt exceeds the amount paid to borrow that debt, that's a win for the stockholders because they'll end up at the end of the day with more value for the same equity. On the other hand, cons. Management's increased reliance on creditor financing increased risks because principal and interest must be paid. Otherwise, the company can go to bankruptcy. Interest rates could rise over the period, causing income to decrease further if this is floating debt. Overall, there's no single appropriate debt-to-equity ratio. There are many techniques to determine it, but really that's beyond the scope of this course. The key thing for you to take away is that a significant change in that trend is worthy of further question. The next leverage ratio is the times interest earned ratio. The times interest earned ratio indicates the company's ability to pay interest to long-term creditors. This is distinguishable from the liquidity ratio or current ratio because this relates to long-term debt and the current ratio regarded short-term debt. The Leverage ratio known as the times interest earned ratio is calculated as income from operations divided by interest expense. In our company, we see the trend that the times interest ratio is decreasing. In other words, we are earning less from operations as compared to how much we're paying on interest. This is a problem. The company's ratio is decreasing, so interest expense is increasing at a greater rate than income from operations. Now, this could be because the uh, interest rate is rising and we're actually paying a larger percentage. It could also mean that operations are becoming less efficient. In either case, these are grounds for concerns and creditors may want to assess the company's plans and projections because as the company's income from operations as a function of interest expense decreases. In other words, as the interest earned ratio decreases, the company will become less and less able to pay its debt over time since it's not generating enough income from its operations to pay its interest expense. Let's next turn to market ratios, which are going to help investors decide whether to invest or buy shares or give a loan to a company or divest, meaning sell shares or get rid of their, their debts in a company.
There are several market ratios to consider, and these are helpful in comparing companies when they are similar enough to compare. The first market ratio is earnings per share, or EPS. It measures stockholder returns on a per share basis, meaning if you own one share, how much are you earning by having that investment outstanding? All else being equal, you'd like to have an investment that generates the most earnings per share possible. Earnings per share is calculated by, in the numerator, net income minus preferred stock dividends, all divided by the number of common stock outstanding. In other words, how much is being earned from the entire business less how much is being paid to other stockholders giving you an effective type of net income net of preferred dividends divided by how many shares of common stock there are and this will show you effectively how much the common shareholders are earning each so let's assume that we have a company with no preferred shares to make the calculation even easier so it's just net income divided by number of common outstanding in this company, earnings per share remains stable over the three years because the number of common shares issued has not changed. We've gone from $1.12 per share to $1.17 per share to $1.16 per share. Not a large percentage difference and not cause for any alarm. But again, we would want to compare this to other firms in the same industry to see if this is a better or worse investment. The price to earnings ratio is one of the most important ratios in deciding what stock to purchase. It's calculated by dividing the market price per share by the earnings per share. In other words, how much does the market value this particular company by showing that the market price is higher or lower versus how much the shares earn? Let's take a look at this company and notice that the share price is going up while the earnings per share are staying flat. The market price is one of the most important measures of a company's financial performance because many believe that the stock market actually tells us valuable information about what these companies are truly worth. And when a company increases its market value, that's a way of the world saying this company is getting better. This earnings performance, often expressed as a P-E ratio, is increasing for this company from 3.57 to 4.27 to 5.17. This is favorable. It shows that the company is becoming more valuable in the eyes of the market, regardless of how much it's actually earning per stockholder share. The rising P.E. ratio suggests investors believe future profits will increase in the coming years. Investors are often willing to pay more for this company's common shares because they're anticipating future financial profits. And so, even though this company had some bad years, this P.E. ratio increasing shows the market has confidence that this company will get better over time. The next ratio analysis is dividend yield. The amount of short-term cash return expected from an investment in the company's shares. Dividend yield is calculated by dividing dividend per share by market price per share. Dividends are the amount of money the company pays its shareholders in a given period. Some investors hold onto shares in order to receive dividends, and dividend yield is an important ratio for their analysis. Some investors, on the other hand, hold stock because they want to sell it later. And this strategy would care more about P.E. ratio and projection of future profits. But investors who want to maximize their dividend yield will hold on to stock not for what it's worth in the future, but for what it pays them on an ongoing basis. So this dividend yield is an important metric for the kind of investor that wants to receive ongoing payments from a stock. The dividend yield is calculated in the following table for a hypothetical company. We see that the company did declare dividends in each of the three years, and we can calculate the dividend yield ratio by comparing the dividends per share divided by the market price per share. 
as shown in the chart below, giving the dividend yield ratio. In this company, investors have received decreasing amounts of dividends relative to market price. And if this trend continues in the future, this means that investors that are looking for cash returns from stock will become increasingly unhappy with this investment. The yield for the dividends per share went from 0.15 to 1 to 0.14 to 1 to 0.13 to 1. In other words, the amount that each investor was receiving for each dollar invested as a function of dividends was going down over time, making this a less and less appealing stock for investors who are looking for steady cash returns. The dividend yield ratio is interesting for more than just determining if this is a good stock to receive dividends. It also tells us something about whether the company is healthy in light of the other data we've analyzed. Remember that this company had an increasing debt to equity ratio over a period of time. In other words, it was taking on more debt and paying a significant financing cost each year. Given that, why is the company issuing dividends at all instead of reinvesting that, that cash into operations or using that cash to pay down its debts? So it's interesting to note that dividends declared increased over the past three years, even though net income remained relatively flat and the company had a poor liquidity position. Investors might ask why high levels of dividends are being paid in this situation. I know we just went through a whole bunch of numbers, and you might want to take some time and review the book to make sure that you have kept track of all of those. But I hope that it did give you a sense of how overall the analysis works, and moreover, let's step back and take a big picture look before we move on. Ratio analysis is useful if accompanied by overall industry performance ratios. We want to know how this company compares to others, and ratios give us a common way to do that, at least within like companies. In addition, general economic indicators are also informative. If the, uh, if the Treasury's uh, yield on 10-year government-issued bonds is going up dramatically, and interest rates are going up dramatically, then it's not so surprising to see an interest in financing costs reflected in the ratios. But if we see that without any basis, maybe the company's credit rating is getting worse or it's having trouble servicing its debt or getting lenders. We also would look at the company's performance over time, a horizontal analysis. And this work is actually fairly hard. So when it comes to public companies, a lot of investors rely on professional analysts who are going to provide their opinions. Other things to note, looking at just the plain numbers isn't so helpful. For example, here, sales were increasing, but net income didn't ca keep up. Gross profits were stable, but operating expenses were a problem. And income from operations has not kept up with increases in the asset base, including increases in current assets. So, this company has some good numbers, but when we start breaking down the ratios, we can see some problems. Some particular problems in this company were as shortage of working capital and poor liquidity is an immediate concern. The company is increasingly unable to service its ongoing liabilities and its short-term debts. The company needs to review its credit policies and monitor its inventory levels to ensure it stays in line with sales. The plant expansion caused an increase in current liabilities due to increased borrowings. The company had to take on debt to expand its operations. As a result, its ability to meet its debt obligation is weakening because it's not generating enough income to cover this interest expense and the cost of financing. It may not have been such a good idea to expand. Expanding at this point might have actually caused a diseconomy of scale showing some inefficiencies with the company at its current size. The company should investigate alternatives to short-term borrowing, such as converting some to long-term debt and or issuing additional share capital so that it can 
converts some of its financial structure from debt to equity. It can issue more shares of stock, use the money it raises from that to pay off its debt, what we call retiring debt, and that can help put its debt to equity ratio into better alignment. But despite the shortcomings that we just described and found in our analysis, the stock market price indicates it expects the company to increase its profits in the future. Perhaps these negative ratios are only temporary or easily rectified by management. It's more of an art than a science to take all of these and figure out what to do with your financial future and where to put your money. But hopefully by using ratio analysis, you can start to get a feel for what companies are promising investments. Let's move on to our second and final topic in this module. We're going to discuss horizontal and vertical trend analysis. Trend analysis is the evaluation of financial performance based on a restatement of financial statement dollar amounts to percentages. In other words, instead of looking at absolute numbers, we'll create ratios that are more easy to compare over time. Horizontal analysis starts with the oldest base year as 100%. All subsequent offense, all subsequent years are expressed as an increase or decrease vis-a-vis -vis the base year. Let's perform some horizontal trend analysis on our company to see if it reveals more information about whether it is or is not a good investment and to understand better its financial health. Let's begin by looking at sales and how those sales relate to profits and income. Remember, we take the oldest year on record as the base year. So the oldest year is always 100%. And the other years shown here, we're going to look at the change vis-a-vis -vis that base year. So again, the base year is a number and we establish that number to be 100%. That's just how we set our, our baseline. And then we compare how the numbers changed year over year. So if we start by looking at sales, we saw that sales went from $50 in 2019 to $70 in 2020, which is an increase of 100 is 140 percent. And if we compare again from baseline to 2021, we see that we went from $50 to $100 in sales which is going from 100% to 200%. And that gives us the ability within a given year to now have some comparisons. How did sales change relative to gross profits and net incomes in a given year? And we see that gross profit grew in 2020 faster than sales or net income did, meaning we banked a lot of profit, but we didn't realize that in our income as much as you might expect. There was some inefficiency there such that some of those profits didn't result in bottom line income. Again, let's calculate that looking at current assets, long-term investments, and total assets. Once again, we set the baseline year to 2019, and then every year is compared to 2019, and we display that as a percentage difference from the 2019 numbers. So in 2020, we saw that we went from $20 to $22 in current assets, and we'll mark that as 110% for 2020. When we go to 2021, again, look back to the baseline year, and the change, actually, we went down. We have fewer current assets in 2021, so that number will be less than 100%, or 90% in this case. We can achieve a similar analysis, instead of using 100% as a baseline, to talk about a percentage change. And we can likewise use this to compare what changed more in a given set of years. So to use this alternative approach, we would simply look at the percent change between two years, and instead of setting the first year to a baseline. So we calculate, for example, sales, by looking at the change, so 170, the difference is 30. We then divide the difference, 30, over the baseline amount to show the amount changed, which is then 30 divided by 70. And to put it in terms of percentage, we multiply by 100, or we can also express it as a fraction. 
And in that way, we can show that the percent change was 43% for those years. Likewise, we can calculate the change in net income by calculating the difference. In this case, 14 minus 12 it is a difference of 2. We divide 2, the difference, by the baseline amount, 12, which gives us the percent change of 17%. And to show you one more example, we can also calculate the change in gross profit. Gross profit went from $45 to $48 for a difference of 3. We divide 3, the change, by the baseline amount, 45, giving us a percent difference of 7%. This is horizontal analysis because it calculates the change between years. You can think of a time horizon as a helpful mnemonic to remember this is horizontal analysis when we're dealing with a change over years. Vertical analysis requires the financial statement to be restated as a percentage of a base dollar amount. For income statement analysis, sales is the base dollar amount as 100%. For balance sheet analysis, total assets, total liabilities, and equity are used as base amounts. And once we establish this base, we can then convert the other numbers to percentages. When we do this vertical analysis and convert statements to percentages, they are called, these percentages are called common size financial statements. And it's helpful because instead of seeing the absolute number, we see a percentage, and percentages can be more readily compared between companies of very different sizes, at least if they're in the same industry and are reasonably comparable. Here's an example of performing a vertical analysis. So in vertical analysis, our baseline is always going to be sales. And so we're going to begin with sales as 100% and then look at everything else as a percentage of sales. So first we calculate the percentage of gross profits as a function of sales. We do that by dividing the gross profit by sales, resulting in a common size number or percentage for gross profit. So here we calculate that. It's really quite simple of uh, the gross profit, 30, divided by sales, 50. And to make it a percentage, you can either think of it a percentage as a, uh, as a, as a decimal, or you can multiply by 100 to get a number that you can tack on a percentage to, and that gives you 60%. Likewise, we can calculate net income as a factor of sales, and we calculate that as 10 divided by 50, because net income is 10 and sales is 50. 10 divided by 50 is going to result in 20%. In other words, net income was 20% of sales in that year. And we can do the same thing with current assets. We can do the same thing with liabilities and equities as well. Once again, we have to set a baseline, and that baseline is going to be total assets, or in the case of liabilities, total equities, or in the case of, sorry, in the case of liabilities, total liability, in the case of equity, total equity. So here we're looking at our assets, and so we're going to look at our total assets. It's 240. Uh, what percentage of that is current assets? Well, current assets are 20. 20 divided by 240 is 8%. Next, let's take a look at long-term investments as a function of total assets. Long-term assets are 80, divided by 240 is 33%. And again, we can use this to compare within a given period, hence vertical. It's looking at one period. It helps us understand how our different aspects on our financial statement compare with each other. In conclusion, we covered a lot of ground today, and I wouldn't be at all surprised if you need to turn back to your book to review some of the details here. My overall goal was to give you a high-level approach to understanding all the different ways we can use ratio analysis, but let's recap briefly the details of what we learned. We first looked at liquidity ratios, which are analysis of short-term cash needs and the company's ability to meet those needs. In other words, is it able to use its current assets, 
to cover its current liabilities, known as the current ratio. We also will look at the quick ratio, also known as the acid test ratio, which excludes things that are technically current assets but cannot be converted to cash quickly. One of those critical current assets is accounts receivable, so we might separately analyze our accounts receivable collection period. And we can add to that the number of days of sales of inventory, which together show us how long our revenue operating cycle takes. And that informs how well the company can pay its suppliers and continue to operate. In addition to liquidity, we talked about profitability. For profitability, we looked first at the gross profit ratio, which is the percentage of revenue left after the cost of goods sold is deducted. But it doesn't tell us all that much because, in fact, there are lots of other costs that can go into the ability to continue operating. The operating profit ratio went a little bit further down the line and calculated the percent of revenue left after cost of goods sold and other operating expenses are deducted. In other words, the operating profit ratio would include more costs than the gross profit ratio. And the net profit ratio includes yet more costs again. The net profit ratio calculates the percent of revenue left after all the costs, including now tax and financing costs, are deducted. The sales to total assets ratio equals our top line net sales revenue divided by assets. And it shows how efficient is the company at using its assets to generate sales. The return on equity ratio calculates the bottom line net income after all the costs are deducted and divides that by the amount of total equity. And that shows how efficiently the equity is put to use to generate profits. Third, we looked at leverage ratios. Leverage regards the financial structure of the corporation and reflects the relationship between stockholders and creditors. Remember that assets always equal liabilities plus equity. Assets is the amount of value the company has, Liabilities is the amount of those assets that are owed to creditors, and equity is the amount of those assets owed to stockholders. The debt ratio slash the equity ratio, uh, because these vary together, they vary inversely, the debt ratio simply divides total liabilities by total assets and shows what percent of the company is owed to creditors. The equity ratio, likewise, divides the total equity by total assets. And since liabilities plus equity equals assets, these ratios will always vary in inversely to each other. The times interest earned ratio indicates a company's ability to pay interest to long-term creditors, and it's calculated by dividing income from operations by interest expense. And fourth, we looked at market ratios, which can be used to compare corporations to each other or to industry benchmarks. They are used to help investors to decide whether to invest or divest investments in a corporation. Earnings per share measures stockholders' returns on a per share basis. The price earnings ratio is calculated by dividing the market price per share by earnings per share. It's thought to show the market's expectations of a corporation's future projected profitability. The dividend yield is calculated by dividing the dividend per share by the market price per share. And this metric is useful for investors who are looking to obtain steady cash income from dividends through their investments. We also talked about horizontal analysis, which shows financial information as a percent of change from a given base year. It's used to evaluate a company based on year-over-year -year changes. 
And finally, we talked about vertical analysis, which shows financial information as a percentage of a base dollar amount. For balance sheet analysis, we would use total assets, total liabilities, or total equity as a base amount. This makes it easier to understand the correlation between single items on a balance sheet and the bottom line for that item's category. Thanks for attending this lecture on financial statement analysis. I hope it helps you understand how to evaluate financial opportunities in your future.